piracy, also known as that one thing that constantly asks you not to try and download a car. So to that one kid in fourth grade who showed up with a PNG of a 2001 Lamborghini Diablo, count your days buddies because the feds are coming. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, piracy was a big forefront to get from corporations to stop people from illegally buying or downloading their products. There were even PSAs and sort of sketches like this one that helped prove that point. Uh, hey, come look at the site. Oh, cool. Can you download the Foo Fighters? Uh, yeah. Hold on. That's massive! What did I do? You know it's illegal, download copyrighted music. I'm taking you in. Uh, Pay for music, never legally download. Calm down, kids. It's just a PSA. It can't hurt you. The feds aren't coming for you. Yet, that is. But this does bring up a big question I always have of why has piracy changed so much? Why was it that back then piracy was considered the devil's magic and nobody was meant to dabble in it lest you face the consequences, but nowadays it feels like everybody and their grandmother pirates, from small things like lawnmower hand manuals to actual things of proper value like 100 gigabyte copies of Tekken 8 that cost around 60 to 80 dollars. Well, it's because of how the internet basically changed everything. But for us to properly take a field trip on this, we need to go back to the early years of 2011. Alright, 2011. I know some of you aren't old enough to remember this year or even live through it, so allow me to give you a brief synopsis. In 2011, Barack Obama was the United States' current president. During this time, Ethiopia actually adopted the euro and became the 17th country to do so, making it the 17th country to join the eurozone. In this same year, the United States Navy SEALs would find and take down Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and ironically find a hard drive with pirated Naruto episodes on it, which is quite ironic looking back on it now. And probably the most important is that India won the 2011 World Cricket Cup. But 2011 would also be the year that the US government would try to heavily crack down on piracy and copyright infringement as a whole with a congressional bill known as SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. And before SOPA was ever even introduced, there was something put in place to protect copyright material on the internet, a well-known thing known as DMCA. DMCA has existed since 1998 for the protection of copyrighted works from illegally being abused and redistributed on the internet. The big problem with DMCA during this time was how do you implement it in an ever-vasting, ever-changing landscape like the internet, a place where there's thousands upon thousands of websites to visit and thousands upon thousands of blogs being created amongst millions and millions of people. At the time, it was just very hard to implement, but nowadays it's very simple. Wherever there's people trying to profit off of copyright material, there's DMCA to protect it. Like if you try to upload copyright material on YouTube, you'll be hit with a DMCA strike, a claim, you'll be have your video taken down, or you'll even find that it's been blocked in most parts of the world, depending on what you decided to upload. Or even if you stream copyright material, you'll find that your stream has been DMCA striked and you could find yourself banned at that point. But SOPA was supposed to be the big boogeyman that was supposed to stop all pirates that sailed the seven seas of the internet dead in their tracks. SOPA on the base level wanted to expand the abilities of the U.S. law enforcement so that they had the ability to combat copyright infringement and online trafficking and counterfeit goods a lot easily. They even later state that this could be used to tackle online counterfeit drug transactions and stop that market in its tracks as well. When you look into the counterfeit drug market, you actually find that they made a ton of money in early 2000s to 2010, where they made over $100 billion annually selling drugs like cocaine, methamphetamines, heroin, and even marijuana, th and without even using the internet most of the times. But they found that with the internet, people would abuse it for such cases, and that SOPA would cover it as well. But there was one thing that a lot of people who defended this bill didn't take into account, and that was, how do you actually enforce such a law? Now you may be asking yourself, where does the US government even begin when it comes to policing the entire internet? A place where there are hundreds of thousands of websites created and taken down daily, as well as hundreds of millions of users logging on and off hourly. A place where most piracy doesn't even actually happen in the US. A deep dive from 2017 found that most places that contribute to piracy are countries like Brazil, Russia, India, and China, 
where India and Brazil mainly pirate music as a large percentage of their piracy population. But Russia also gave a staggering statistic of 91% of Russians preferring to pirate over paying for content, and 75% of them actually resorting to piracy to save them on money of quality of life things like games, movies, movies, you get the point. So with this, SOPA now had a very limited reach inside the United States. And with that, you also had a big problem from the opposition saying how unusable the internet would be because of SOPA being there. People who opposed this bill constantly brought up the point of what would you do with a site like eBay where it had one user that was selling counterfeited Crocs or a counterfeited good on them? Would you take down the entirety of the website and punish innocent people because of one bad actor within the system? It's kind of like the mentality of a teacher punishing the entire classroom because of one bad kid acting out. And with this, SOPA was slowly starting to lose ground if it had any to start with. The opposition for SOPA got so bad at one point that in 2012, companies like Google, the English Wikipedia, and 7,000 smaller websites all did a nationwide blackout on January 18th to prove how inaccessible the internet would be under SOPA's law. And with this, it slowly died off until SOPA had no supporters left and would be considered a dead bill. Which leads into the current era of piracy we have nowadays. Don't get me wrong, there was a time where they tried playing digital whack-a-mole with all these pirating websites before they just said enough's enough and let sleeping dogs lie. And unless someone's being an absolute scumbag making people pay a subscription service to one singular person for pirating games or movies or anime, there's not going to be any real involvement and even then, the best thing that'll happen is a lawsuit telling the person to cease and desist. But piracy has become such a necessity nowadays, especially with how the quality of media has gone down for the price that we have to pay for it. The best example I can give in recent times is Dragon Dogma 2, a game I was very excited for only to find out that it would be $80 for a game that didn't work on launch. A game that would run for 5 minutes on PC before crashing and would be frame locked at 30 FPS on PS5. Which is why I can't wait for people to torrent it and actually fix the problems with the game so that you can actually enjoy it. I always find that people who pirate games will later go back and give money to the respective people that do it, whether it's an indie dev or triple A, but pirating nowadays is just to make sure that you're getting the quality of content you'd want for the price you'd be wanting to pay. It's one of those things that just happens on the internet and there's no stopping it no matter what you do. Piracy is going to exist whether you have a moral compass or not. Changing it is just an impossible task. It's like the ebb and flow of calamity or karma. It's going to exist whether you want it to or not.